Good morning and happy Easter. I want to welcome you who are worshiping online with our church family, the Milton Seventh-day Baptist Church, especially on this very special of weekends, the time when we celebrate and remember the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My invitation for you this morning is to pursue Jesus, to press in to know him. He's here to meet with us, and we are here to meet with him. Remember the words of James where he said, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Draw near to him as we're singing our songs of worship, as we're celebrating in the taking of the Lord's Supper together, and in the preaching of the word. If you haven't gathered the elements for communion, I would invite you to do that now. Bread to represent the body of Christ and juice to represent his blood that was shed for us. And after the message this morning, we will celebrate the Lord's Supper together. So come, let us worship. Jesus is alive. He is risen. And we are here to worship him. Would you pray together with me? Lord Jesus, it is good to remember all that you've done for us. And today we especially remember the, the uh, death uh, that you gave, your life for us. And we praise you when we worship you. And I pray, Lord, that you would fill us now, fill us with your presence, that you would draw us to know you. Uh, and that, Father, that you would open our eyes in a greater way to see you as you truly are and that we could take our greatest joy and our greatest glory and our greatest pleasure in you. Uh, may you be praised and glorified in and through us this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mark 16, 1 through 7. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. I believe in the risen 
15 through 14. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its own legal demands. This he set aside, nailing to the cross. Sealed the promise, your very 
John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life.
when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Christ Jesus. today and he is worthy and uh, as we take a 
few moments here to do the uh, time of our worship where we offer ourselves, where we offer our finances uh, to the Lord in humble acknowledgement that everything we have is a gift of God and we return to Him a portion um, uh, in faith. And uh, so we're going to sing a song here. Um, Jesus paid it all. We don't give our offering because we're trying to get something from God. He paid it all in his body on the cross. And we respond with our offerings to him uh, in humble gratitude for all that he has done uh, for us. And so let's uh, sing Jesus paid it all. need to put it up key? <clears throat> I think that's a yes. <laughs> mm, a little bit more. This is a highly <clears throat> experienced and uh, professional singing here. I hear the Savior say Thy strength indeed is small Child of me Watch and pray, finding me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. that Jesus was willing to die on a cross for our sins. 
and we're going to read a story out of the Child's Story Bible by Catherine Voss. Can you listen to my story? Yeah. The soldiers fastened to the top of the cross the title which Pilate had written in Greek and in Hebrew and in Latin, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then they stretched Jesus out upon the cross. With heavy spikes they nailed his blessed hands and feet to the wooden beams. They raised the cross and set it in the hole which they had dug and filled the hole with stones and earth so that the cross would stand upright. Two thieves were crucified with Jesus, one on his right hand and one on his left. When they'd finished all this, the soldiers divided up Jesus' clothes among them. His coat was one piece without any seam, so they said, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it. What? They were going to gamble and see who would get Jesus' clothes. It's very painful to you and me to see our beloved Lord hanging there on the cross with his blood dripping down. But even though it's painful, we need to look, for he hangs there because of what we have done. His blood is being shed to pay for our sins. He loved us so much that he chose to die in our place. Even in his great suffering, Jesus thought not of himself, but of others. The first words he uttered were a prayer. Do you remember what Jesus said? Um, forgive their sins? Yep, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Around the cross, Jesus' friends had gathered. The two whom Jesus loved most of all were... His Mary? Yep, his mother. And father. And the beloved disciple John, who were standing close to the cross. He saw them there, and even in his pain, he did not forget them. He said to his mother, John shall be your son. And to John, take my mother to be your mother. From that day, John took her into his house. While Jesus' friends wept, there were many there who were glad to see him die. The scribes and the priests who had cried, Crucify him, had followed to Calvary. Now they jeered and mocked, Save yourself and come down from the cross, and then we will believe in you. He saved others, but he can't save himself, others sneered. One of the thieves who hung beside Jesus joined in, saying, If you are the Christ sent by God, save yourself and us. But the other thief said, How dare you talk like this when you are soon going to die and appear before God? You and I deserve to die because of our wicked deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered, Today you shall be with me in heaven. And that is the promise Jesus gives to every dying one who puts his trust in our Savior. At noon, God took away the light of day. Can you imagine that? How light it is now? And for three hours, it was complete darkness while Jesus hung on the cross. Jesus was suffering pain from the nails in his hands and feet, but he was also suffering a much deeper kind of pain. For during those three hours, God himself turned his back on his dearly beloved son and left him. Why? Why is that? God is so holy that he can't be around sin, right? So he couldn't be around Jesus because he was around sin? Because Jesus took all the sins of the world, of you and me and everybody else. He willingly took that upon him. And God, a holy God, can't be around sin. So he had to separate himself. That's much more serious, right, than the social distancing that we're doing. And Jesus felt all alone. All his life on earth, Jesus had loved God and served him perfectly without any sin. But now he had taken upon himself all the sin that's ever been done or ever will be done in this whole world. Your sin and my sin and the sin of every single person who puts his trust in Jesus as a savior. God gave him the punishment you and I deserve to suffer. God separated himself from Jesus so that Jesus felt only God's anger against sin and no longer his love for his son. 
than that is the worst punishment any person can ever suffer. And in his anguish, Jesus cried out. Remember what he said? Um, well, he said that before. Yep. This time he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus was forsaken by God so that you and I would never be forsaken by God. It is no wonder that in those black hours the light of the sun was withdrawn and the whole earth was plunged in darkness. Just before the end, Jesus said, I thirst, and someone kindly gave him a sponge stuck in vinegar and raised it to Jesus' mouth to drink. It was almost over now. Jesus knew his work was done. He cried out in a loud voice, It is finished! And then he said one last thing, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Then he died. The suffering was over. The work he had come to do was done. He had paid for our sins. And what happened when Jesus died? He rose again. He did rise again. But right at this point, the, there was an earthquake. The ground trembled and shook and great rocks fell apart and the veil of the temple was torn. Yeah. Remember that part? Yes. Yeah. And what does that represent? That represents that everybody can be inside. Right. There's no longer a separation at that point, right? Only one day a year, the high priest could go in and offer a sacrifice. Yeah. Right? But at this point, Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice on the cross, and no longer do we need to do that. We don't need to take a lamb and sacrifice it anymore because Jesus was the Lamb of God. Everyone could go into the Holy of Holies where before Jesus paid for our sins. There's no longer a need for a veil to separate those who trust in Jesus from the Holy God. Can you sit back down with me? The captain of the Roman soldiers was astonished to see the greatness of the suffering saved and the signs of God's anger in the three hours of darkness and the earthquake. And he said, truly, this was the Son of God. And the captain was right. It was truly the very Son of God who died there on the cross of Calvary. He died for us. He gave his very life to pay for our sins. As the prophet said long before, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. By his stripes we are healed go to the same Jesus today with all our sorrows and all our problems and all our sins. Which one did he die on? He sees us, and he hears us, and he loves us. If we trust and love him, we have new life, a joyous, happy life, for he shall take away all our burdens. Shall we not love and serve this wonderful Jesus who finished the work of our salvation on the cross? Thank you very much. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. I am so glad that God gives us his grace. And today as we think about the death and resurrection of Jesus, there is no greater example of God's grace in all of human history than Christ's death on the cross uh, because he loved us so much. This message is being uh, recorded on Good Friday. It's just a little past three o'clock in the afternoon, and I want you to think with me. Many years ago on a Friday, about three o'clock in the afternoon, this is when Jesus said those words, it is finished, and he breathed his last, and he died. That was the completion of God's work through Christ in this life. And then three days later, Jesus rose from the grave. For Christians, this is a very good day. We know that Jesus had to die, for without his death, there would be no resurrection. Without his death and resurrection, there would be no hope for ourselves because we would not have the hope of the resurrection and eternal life with God. We preach Christ crucified and risen, because it is the foundation of the gospel message, the message that our Lord Jesus gave to us. This message, which is the power of God for salvation, brings freedom from the dreadful curse of sin. 
Jesus has been raised from the dead, and that's what really happened. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a made-up story. It's the gospel truth which has been passed along to us generation upon generation. It's the message that Paul passed on to the people in the city of Corinth in the year 50 AD. For some people, the message of the gospel is not relevant to their understanding. It's not relative, relevant to their life, and experience, ex, life experience. Now, as we've been talking about in our series here on the natural person and the spiritual person, Paul refers to these who cannot relate to the gospel message as natural people. They are natural because the spiritual part of them is dead and unable to know and relate to God who is spirit. Over the course of uh, this series on Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, I have emphasized the distinction that Paul makes between the natural person and the spiritual person. I've been going over and over uh, this ground because even though uh, naturally speaking, there might not seem to be much difference between a natural person and a spiritual person, spiritually speaking, the differences are cosmic. Sometimes we don't recognize when we look with our eyes, when we look with our understanding, our human understanding, the difference between a natural person and a spiritual person, but the difference is enormous. Paul says that a natural person rejects the gospel of Christ because they see it as foolish. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says this, The word of the cross, that's the gospel message, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved. It is the power of God. Now, the fact that Jesus had to die on a cross is a dividing line between those whom God is saving from their sinful condition and those who reject God's offer of rescue and salvation from sin. On this weekend, where we especially remember the death and the resurrection of the Lord, let me allow the Apostle Paul to set the stage for us by reading his words from 1 Corinthians 15, starting in the first verse. So I invite you to grab your Bibles and read along with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to start in the first verse. And Paul writes, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word that I preached to you, unless, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and then he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Now jump down to verse 12. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there's no resurrection from the dead? But if there's no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still dead in your sins. Those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we of all people are most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, he's referring to Adam there, Adam sinned, and because of sin, death came into the world. For by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, the Christ of first fruits, and then at his coming those who belong to Christ. 
And so we see that Paul highlights the fact that death is our condition as human beings who live under the curse, the weight of sin, which was passed on to us by our forefather, Adam. Jesus destroyed the power of death by dying himself, and his resurrection guarantees the resurrection of all who place their faith in him. But when we, when we talk about Jesus' death, at times we don't spend enough time answering the question, why did Jesus have to die? And that's going to be the focus of our message this morning. Why did Jesus have to die? Certainly we understand that Jesus died for our forgiveness. He underst we understand that, that Jesus was the sacrifice for our sins. But there's some details about why he died that we need to understand because it underscores the importance of God's grace, the importance of God's uh, holiness and his um, uh, righteousness. And uh, these things are important for us to know and to have solidified as a foundation for our faith. We know that Jesus died. We know he came back to life. We know that his hands and, feet's, hands and feet were nailed to the cross. We know that he, he wore a crown of thorns. We know that he was whipped. We know that he was unjustly accused and sentenced to death. We know that he was placed in a borrowed tomb and that Roman soldiers guarded the entrance. We know that he rose from the grave at first light on that Sunday morning. We are familiar with the story, but we might not understand why exactly it needed to happen. Now I'm thankful uh, for a little book by Pastor John Piper called The Passion of Jesus Christ, from which I have uh, taken the answers to this question, why did Jesus have to die? Now, Piper highlights 50 reasons, and uh, you can be thankful that I'm not going to highlight all 50 of those reasons. I will take only five of them today, but uh, there are more than just five reasons why Jesus had to, today, but these are some of uh, what I think are the most important reasons that you, as one who's considering following Christ, or one who is a devoted Christ follower, needs to know. Jesus didn't die by accident. He died on purpose, and here's why. The first one is to absorb the wrath of God. Why did Jesus die? He died to absorb the wrath of God. Now, I want to read some quotes uh, from John Piper in each one of these points because I think he says uh, things very well. Here's what Piper has to say about God absorbing um, uh, Jesus having to die to absorb the wrath of God. If God were not just, there would be no demand for his son to suffer and die. If God were not loving, there would be no willingness for his son to suffer and die. But God is both just and loving. Therefore, his love is willing to meet the demands of his justice. Now, the Bible is clear that God is just. He is a God of justice. Isaiah 30, 18, the Lord is a God of justice. Leviticus 19, 2, God says, I, the Lord, your God, am holy. God is righteous. He is perfect. He is pure. He is a just and holy God. God, as a just and holy God, is angry to the point of wrath against all evil and all sin just precisely because he is holy and just. If he, as Almighty God, were to not punish evil, then we could rightfully say about him that he is not a righteous God, that he's not a God of justice, and he's not the holy God that he says he is. However, in fact, we do know that God does punish sin, and he punishes evil. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, and so we understand that physical death is assured for us precisely because Human beings, we have sinned. And as Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Spiritual death is the reality of the separation that occurs when a sinful human being, a, a human being sins and a holy God cannot allow that sinful being, sinful human being to be in his presence. That separation is, is the spiritual death. The spiritual death is when we are separated from God, who is the source of all life. 
Now, many people have a beef against God. They want God to bring justice to the evil in the world. And as they look out, they look and they see injustices everywhere. And sometimes this brings up a lot of anger towards God. It brings up unbelief. It brings up all kinds of questions about who God is and why as a just God would he not punish uh, sin and evil. But the failure to that, that, that those who um, have this argument against God um, are falling into is that they fail to realize that it is their own evil and their own sin which contributes to the reality of sin, the reality of evil in the world. It is our human sinful nature that likes to magnify the evil of other people and to minimize our own human failures and faults. We want God to be just with other people, but towards ourselves, we want his mercy. If we are to say, how can God let this evil in the world go on? then we are by that statement pointing a finger of judgment at ourselves. In fact, God should have wiped us out a long time ago because a holy and just God must respond to sin and evil in the world, including our own. But in point of fact, God is more complex than that. He is not just a holy and just God. He is also a God of love. And the Lord, because of his limitless love for us, has taken care of that punishment that we deserve as evil sinners. And that is the truth. We are evil sinners. He has taken care of our punishment in Christ. 1 John 4.10 says this, And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, that word propitiation is not one that I, uh, I'm sure you've used very often. But propitiation refers to the removal of God's wrath. Now, how does that happen? How is God's wrath or anger against evil and sin, how is that removed? It's removed simply by providing a substitute. The substitute that God provided was himself. Jesus Christ does not cancel God's wrath. He absorbs God's wrath. He diverts it from we who deserve it and has taken it on himself in his death on the cross. God's wrath is just. It is justified against evil. And it was spent, not withdrawn, but spent in Jesus, on Jesus, on the cross. And so God's justice requires punishment for sin, but God's love has provided a way for God's wrath against sin to be spent. And so, why did Jesus have to die? To absorb the wrath of God. Now, the second reason why Jesus had to die was to show the wealth of God's love and grace for sinners. To show the wealth of God's love and grace for sinners. Here's a quote, again, from John Piper. The measure of God's love for us is shown by two things. One of them is the degree of his sacrifice in saving us from the penalty of our sin. The other is the degree of unworthiness that we had when he saved us. Now, Jesus' death was brutal by all human standards. If it was only the physical nature of his death, we could still probably say that it was one of the most horrific ways of dying that human beings have invented. Yet it was not just the physical agony that we must recognize in his death on the cross. On the cross, God the Father, according to Isaiah 53, verse 6, laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. What does that mean? God the Father, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he put our sins on his body. And so the the pain and the agony that Jesus was experiencing was not simply the physical um, uh, pain that he, that he was undergoing. It was also a spiritual reality of sin. And I'll recognize, remember, Jesus didn't have any sin. He was perfectly obedient to the Father. And as God laid the Father, laid the sins of the whole world from uh, the beginning of time to the end on Jesus, there was a, uh, a separation that occurred 
And Jesus, in responding to the sin, the weight of the sin that was laid on him in Mark 15, 34, said this, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The weight of all of our sins he carried on himself. Now, remember the context of this, that the, the um, degree of the punishment was extreme. And it wasn't just a physical extreme, it was a spiritual extreme. Jesus took all of the sins of the entire world from all of history on himself. That's a huge weight. That's a, a, something that can't even be measured, humanly speaking. All of this is in the context of our response. Now Isaiah 53 also says in verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way. And when it says we've turned our, our, our own way, we've turned away from God with no intention of coming back to him. Or if we, if we uh, come back to him, it's only on our terms. God, I'll follow you if this and if this. We are sinners intentionally, willfully. And that is in our sinful nature outside of a relationship with Christ by faith. Now, the Lord's love is magnified by the fact that there was nothing in human beings, sinful human beings, that made us worthy of his love. And yet, he loved us just the same. And we see this, Romans 5.8 says this, God shows his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still desiring to have nothing to do with God, while we were still desiring to go our own way, while we were still desiring to reject God, that wasn't a big enough obstacle. God still, in Christ, died for us. You see, the Lord was not dissuaded by our lack of interest in Him, by the lack of our, the repentance of our own hearts. His love could not be turned away. And as the Lord Himself said, in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever, whosoever believes in him, shall not perish but have eternal life. And so, why did Jesus die? He died, first of all, to absorb the wrath of God. Secondly, to show the wealth of God's love and grace for sinners. Now, thirdly, Jesus died to cancel the legal demands of the law against us. To cancel the legal demands of the law against us. Here's a quote from John Piper. What a folly it is to believe that one day our good deeds may outweigh our bad deeds. What a folly it is to believe that one day our good deeds may outweigh our bad deeds. Recently I watched the first episode of the TV show called The Good Place. Now I haven't watched beyond the first episode to understand the ins and outs of the show, but the premise of making it to the good place in the show is that after you die, if you're a really, really good person, you can make it there. The people that made it into the good place on the TV show were from all kinds of religious backgrounds, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, Christian. It was stated very specifically in the show that all these people had done enough good deeds to make it. Now, this is a tremendous example of the absolute foolishness of the mindset of the person who does not trust Christ Jesus alone for salvation. Most people actually believe that they can do good deeds and enough of them to make it to the good place. And this is absolute folly, absolute foolishness according to God's revelation. Now, uh, the Bible tells us in Romans 14, 23, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Now, let me be specific on this. That means that we can do all kinds of good things. We can do all kinds of things that the rest of the world can look at in good, but if it doesn't proceed from faith in Christ as God himself, then that is actually sin. Now, that's a hard thing for a natural mindset, to uh, understand. People who are, have not trusted in Christ uh, as Savior and Lord have a 
hard time believing that good deeds are not good, but in fact, they stem, they come out of a place that is actually in a, a place of, of turning away from God, of even rebellion against God. You see, God's method for saving is not by balancing out good deeds and bad deeds, but instead canceling the entire record of our bad deeds uh, altogether. Now, listen to Colossians 2, verses 13 to 14. This highlights what I'm saying here. When Paul writes to the Colossians, he says, And you, you were dead in your, trans your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made you alive together with him, having forgiven all of our trespasses, all of our sins, by canceling the record of debt that stood against it with its legal demands. How did he do that? This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. So in Jesus' death on the cross, God nailed this record, this record of our deeds that was against us and stood in our way on the cross. Here's the truth. Here's the reality. Without the cross, there's no way the record of all of our bad deeds can be expunged. There is a ledger, if you will, for each one of us. There is a cosmic account of all of our deeds. And the reality is that we are in debt up to our eyeballs and we cannot even begin to make any kind of money to be able to start to pay off that debt that we owe. The good news, the great news, is that Jesus has already paid all of the debt for us. We don't have to pay the penalty of our debt to God because of our sin against his law because Jesus has already done it for us. In Galatians 3.13, says that Christ redeemed us. He bought us back from what we owed. He redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Make no mistake about it, this offer cannot be found in Islam, or Hinduism, or Buddhism, or Mormonism, or any other way but Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. The record of our debt, it can only be canceled because Jesus himself has paid it by his death, by his blood, therefore, on the cross. And so, why did Jesus have to die? He died to spend the wrath of God. He died to show the wealth of God's love and grace for sinners. He died to cancel the legal demands of the law against us. And uh, next, he died to provide the basis for our justification. He died to provide forgiveness of our sins, or rather, he died to provide the imputation of righteousness. Another quote from John Piper, where he says, being justified before God and being forgiven by God are not identical. Being forgiven implies that I am guilty and my crime is not counted. Being justified implies that I have been tried and found innocent. And those are two important aspects of understanding the redemption that we have in Christ Jesus. Justifying is a legal declaration of innocence. The jury finds that a person is not guilty of the crime of which they've been accused. But in the case of God's court, we're all guilty. There's not one person that can come into God's court and say that they are completely innocent. In Jesus, however, that guilt is removed. Romans 3.24 says this, We are justified by God's grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In God's court, because of Jesus' death on the cross, our crimes against God's perfect law can be removed. Now, removing our guilt is just one part of justification. The other part is what is known as the imputation of the righteousness of Christ. Jesus' perfect obedience to God the Father and his perfect keeping of God's law 
as ca is counted as my righteousness when I place my faith in him. Now, 2 Corinthians 5.21 highlights this. He says, uh, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So God the Father made Jesus to be sin, and Jesus knew no sin, so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. And so Jesus died to give us his righteousness. And the transfer of this righteousness comes when we place our faith in him. Philippians 3, 9 really brings this out. When Paul says that he doesn't have a righteousness of his own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness that Paul was seeking was not the righteousness of good deeds. He was seeking the righteousness that comes from trusting Christ and then Christ. Christ, by the act of trusting him, transfers, gives his righteousness to the person who does not have any righteousness on their own. Without this righteousness of Christ that is a free gift, that's by the grace of God, without this righteousness, we are unable to stand before a righteous and holy judge of the universe and be declared not guilty. Without the righteousness of Jesus, our verdict for sure will be guilty of sin. But in him, in Christ, we can receive the verdict not guilty, justified because of the righteousness of Christ. Now, last point. Why did Jesus have to die? To bring us to God. To bring us to God. John Piper uh, says this, Christianity is not first theology, but news. But what is the ultimate good in the good news? It all ends in one thing, God himself. Jesus dying on the cross was not merely that our sins could be forgiven, but so that by forgiving our sins, we could be brought back to God. 1 Peter 3.18 says this, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. I want to quote uh, John Piper again because the way that he says this is, is so clear. Uh, and I think we really need to understand this point of Jesus died that we could come back to God in perfect relationship with him. Let me read what he says. Many people seem to embrace the good news without embracing God. There is no sure evidence that we have a new heart just because we want to escape hell. That's a perfectly natural desire, not a supernatural one. It doesn't take a new heart to want the psychological relief of forgiveness or the removal of God's wrath or the inheritance of, of God's world. All these things are understandable without any spiritual change. But you see, what God gives to us in grace is not something that we are given without him. He, in fact, is the gift. It is the gift of being brought back to him. The spiritual change of a new heart that God places in us when we trust Christ is that we want to be with God because there's nothing that's more lovable. There's nothing more awesome. There's nothing more beautiful than God himself. The spiritual change of a new heart is that we want to draw close to God, that we begin to desire the things that God desires that we want to submit to God's will, that we want God to be our everything. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 says this, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. The far off condition is a condition of the heart. Jesus died so that our hearts could be close, could come back to God. Now let me speak to those who may not know where you stand with Jesus. If you're a, a natural person, in other words, you think that your good deeds balance out your 
bad ones. And because of that, God will overlook any faults that you have. If that describes you, then it doesn't matter what you've done that's good. It doesn't matter how many times you've gone to church. It doesn't matter how many good deeds you've done. Because none of those good deeds comes anywhere close to being good enough for a completely, 100% righteous, holy God. You need to hear these words today. You are dead in your sins, and right now you're without hope and without God in this world. You need to hear this message of the death and resurrection of Jesus because this is where all your hope lies. It lies not in what you do, but in what Jesus Christ has done for you. I'm begging you today to hear this message as if your very life depends on it, because the reality is, is that your life does depend on it. Come to Jesus. He is calling out to you from the cross and from the empty grave for your heart and for your soul and for your eternity. Now let me speak to those of you who have trusted Christ alone as Savior and Lord. If you're a spiritual person, then you can't be afford to be fuzzy on the truths of the gospel of Christ. If you know, for example, a person who was unclear about Jesus as the only path to life, as the only way to salvation, and you are given an opportunity to be able to clarify for that, that for them, if God opens up the door for the opportunity and you don't take that opportunity, then I want you to hear me. You're dropping the ball. People need to hear that Christ is the way to salvation, that his death and resurrection has bought us life for those who trust in him. Jesus died on a real cross so that the real people that he has placed in your life can have the opportunity to know that without him, they have no hope in this life or in the afterlife. I want to encourage you today, stop being fuzzy about your commitment to him. Jesus wasn't fuzzy about his commitment to you. He was all in on the cross. It's time for you to be all in for him. Your Lord died on a cross for you. It's time for you to pick up your cross, to follow Jesus, and die to your personal agenda. Let this day, this Good Friday, be a very good day for you, because on it, you laid down your life so that you could pick up the life the life that Jesus has for you. The greatest act of love in history was also the most extreme, torturous death. For when Jesus died on the cross, he bore the weight of the combined sins of all of humanity from all time. And he did so willingly out of his great love for us. When you realize just how much the Lord Jesus Christ loves you and understand the extreme lengths he had to go to to bring you to himself, the only true response is worship. To humble yourself before him in faith and in gratitude and complete surrender to his will for your life. And I know no better way to bring this message to a conclusion than to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Jesus offered on the night that before he was betrayed and before he went, uh, the night he was betrayed and before he went to the cross, he offered a meal. The meal consisted of bread and consisted of wine. The bread represents his body. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. The wine, and we use grape juice, typically represents his blood. The blood which is poured out for the forgiveness of, of sins. Jesus gave this to his disciples. He said, do this in remembrance of me. He said, you proclaim my death until my return. By receiving his uh, body and blood, by celebrating, by taking the bread and the juice, we are proclaiming this death of Christ is absolutely essential to our forgiveness. It's an absolutely essential message that the world needs to hear. The world doesn't need to hear more messages about being good. 
The world needs to hear a message that Jesus is our goodness, our righteousness, and no one comes to the Father unless they have received the righteousness of Christ by faith. By taking the bread and the cup, you are proclaiming that you have placed your trust in Jesus alone, that he is your righteousness, and you're proclaiming that his death and resurrection is the only means by which a person must be saved. And so we're going to take this together. I realize that we're separated by space here, but the Lord is with us, and in a very real spiritual sense, we are one together in Christ. And so Jesus took the bread, and he broke it, and he said to his disciples, and he says to us today who follow him, who are his disciples, this is my body. It was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat the bread together. He also took the cup and he said this about it. He said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever God calls people into a relationship with him, he does so by a covenant. He promises to be our God and for us to be his people. And this covenant, this relationship is sealed with his blood, his very blood. It's poured out. He's the sacrifice, the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. By drinking from the cup, we're saying that his blood is what forgives our sin. His blood is what absorbs the wrath of God. His blood is what causes our righteousness uh, uh, to, to uh, be, in, his righteousness to be imputed to us. It's his death and his sacrifice that we proclaim as the means by which we can come into a right and holy and perfect relationship with God. It's all about Jesus. And so, let's drink of the cup together. The cup of his blood poured out for us. What can we say, Lord, but thank you. Thank you, Almighty God. You have been so kind and so gracious to us. There are times when we take lightly the things that you've done for us. We don't recognize how much we've turned away from you. We don't recognize how much you've given for us. But Lord, we ask your forgiveness. And we ask, Lord, that you would open our eyes. And today, we ask that you would draw our hearts closer to you. We ask, Almighty, that you would soften our hearts. Lord, that you would help us to gravitate to the things that you show, that you know are pleasing and are holy and are righteous and are good. Lord, grab our hearts. Draw us close to you. We thank you. And we praise you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen and amen. Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. Sons of men and angels say, Yeah.
Before we go today, I have a few announcements that I want to share with uh, you all. This afternoon, again at 3 o'clock, we will have an opportunity to discuss the message uh, from this morning. We've made a change in the location of that on our uh, Zoom channel, and so you can find out the information on that by going to our website, The Connecting Church, uh, the connecting .church uh, worship online. You can go to the main page and uh, you can uh, connect or uh, click on the worship online and it'll give you some instructions on how to connect into that uh, discussion group at three o'clock. Next, if you have a friend that's in need, if you know someone that has a need, uh, financial need, then our Deacons Fund is specifically designed to help those who are in a financial need. and. Uh, uh, we, of course, will prioritize those who are part of the church family, but we also are well aware of those who are in need outside of our church family. And our Deacons Fund is well-funded now to be able to reach out to others who are outside. So if you know uh, someone who is in need, I invite you to reach out to Pastor Liz and uh, talk with her about that. Um, because if there are needs there, we certainly want to respond uh, to them. Lastly, because of the uncertainty of this time of, of crisis, our activities in person have all been suspended, and uh, one, of the, one of the things we're thinking about is our summer activities, our summer ministries, um, Camp Wakanda, among other things. I want to invite you to stay tuned because we'll be making a decision within the next several weeks about the status of our ministries uh, for the summer. And uh, at this point, we're, we don't have enough information to be able to do that. But stay tuned and uh, we will be preparing for camp and uh, for other ministries in the summer as if uh, they were going to go forward. And that certainly is our hope. I want to invite you to continue to pray uh, for our world and for the quick passing of uh, this crisis, for those who are sick, who are in need, um, uh, for all of those who are um, uh, serving and are on the front lines of this. Uh, I want to encourage you to keep in prayer and keep looking to the Lord and especially look to the things that um, He is trying to teach us and to show us as His people. And so with that, I want to say God bless you, have a happy Easter, have a wonderful uh, rest of your Sabbath day. Uh, I truly hope that you heard in my words today that God loves you, and uh, of course, I love you too. God bless you. Bye-bye.